Welcome to our service this morning on the seventh day of the new year 2024. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the heights and the depths. Praise God, all creatures of earth and sky. Praise God, young and old together. Let us praise the Lord and worship God's holy name. This Sunday is uh, Epiphany, and it it's sort of two as two themes on this Sunday. We have the uh, story of the wise men coming with their gifts, and also Jesus' baptism. So we begin our service with hearing the the visit of the wise men, Matthew two one to twelve. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told them in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is the shepherd, who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search, and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Magi have a symbolic role to play in, the birth, in this birth narrative. Coming from the East, they represent the Gentile or non-Jewish world coming to worship the new king. Also, compared to the humble shepherds, they represent people with a different status in society also coming to worship Jesus. The, the lower class, the higher class, all people are welcome to come, invited to come and worship Jesus. Our opening hymn this morning, We Three Kings, it's 173 in the blue book, the words are on the screen. Thank you. 
let us join our hearts and our voices together in the prayer of approach and prayer of confession and our Lord's Prayer. God of possibility and power, on this first day of the week you began creating, bringing light to shine and bringing order out of chaos. On this first day of the week you began your new creation. By the of our hearts, of our thoughts, and we ask you to forgive us in the year ahead. Help us choose a better way. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us join together in our Lord's Prayer as our children are with us this morning to, to say it with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, and we're set free to make a new start. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our boys and girls are hopefully out playing in the snow this morning or getting rested up before school starts tomorrow. I know there were some excited girls in Centerville this morning who were looking forward to getting back to school tomorrow. Our Epiphany hymn, A Light is Gleaming, yeah, verses 2, 3, and 4, and the words will be on the screen.
Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Let us pray. Creator God, your words set creation in motion. Send your spirit to set our minds in motion as we have heard your holy word today. Add to our insight and challenge our assumptions for the sake of Jesus Christ, your living word. And may these thoughts and words speak your truth in love. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The opening words of Mark's Gospel today, the evangelist proclaims the beginning of the good news. In other words, whatever follows, be it a parable or a teaching, it is good news. Jesus Christ, Christ breaks forth into our hearing, and many remarkable beginnings take place throughout the Gospel. It's also a good way to address the new year. In the beginning of 2024, hear and uphold the good news of Jesus Christ and seek him day by day. 
Yesterday was the 12th day of Christmas, and we uh, had the pleasure, I guess, of taking down our decorations and putting things away. And I have to say, it's a lot more fun putting them up, the decorations up, than putting them away. Although putting them away seems to go considerably faster. But as we pack things away, let us not pack away the spirit of compassion and, and generosity that seems to permeate more readily at, at, Chris, at the Christmas season. That is why it's important today to hear the story of the wise men seeking Jesus. The wise men were a mystery, are a mystery in many ways. Strangers on a, on a quest involving a, a jealous king, a guiding star, extravagant gifts given to uh, a child in awe and wonder. What would Mary and Joseph uh, thought of such gifts as they watched the travelers kneel and present their riches? The strangers from the east set out determined to find the child and in so doing were willing to do whatever was necessary to impart their joy and pleasure, their, their generosity and their devotion in finding Jesus and offering him the very best they could give in an expression of their true joy. Can you think of a time when you gave a gift that you took extreme pleasure in giving? Maybe it was in the preparing of it or, you know, just the planning of it, but you, you received a lot of joy from the gift that you gave. It's so true. It's the, you know, in giving we receive. It's so true. Giving to the food bank, we know whatever we can give helps someone else. Or even in our prayers, when we pray for difficult situations going on in the world, we're giving up our time to, to ask God to help and to draw us into further understanding of others in need. The wise men traveled a, a great distance to find Jesus. About, say, 30-some years later, another wise one, John the Baptist, forged a, a path, inviting people to open their lives in order to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. John, a prophet was a man who did his own thing. He marched to his own beat. He ate from the wild and he wore the clothes of rejection. He sought the desert and its aloneness and starkness and returned with a message of clarity and surrender. And then he acted and accepted the consequences. His focus was always beyond himself. He was not out to seek attention but was bold and inspired and humble in pointing the way for Jesus. Later in his life, he would be beheaded by greedy powers. But John was always liberated from these powers and influences. They didn't stop him. And he was always sort of liberated from himself as well. It was about others. John was a trustworthy, transparent, and faithful prophet. Standing now at the, at the water's edge, Jesus asked John to baptize him. God chose that the good news about Jesus Christ would start with someone else. The good news, in other words, was about Jesus Christ, but not just about himself. Jesus came to be baptized. Jesus didn't need John's baptism. There was nothing Jesus needed forgiveness for. But even still, Jesus asked John to, to be a vital participant in the unfolding in, the life and min, in his life and ministry. And this is the way of God. God wants us to be involved, to be, to be part of the unfolding revelation of God's love and purposes for the world. To stand alongside unlikely partners in doing ministry. To participate in things like the Holy Sacraments in order to show how those things reveal God's ever-loving self. To humble himself so that he might show us what we need to do. A second thought, as we stand at the water's edge, observing Jesus' baptism, we see that the good news about Jesus Christ 
isn't just about Jesus, the second person in the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or our God, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. It's about the whole Trinity. Jesus himself, as Jesus rose up from the water of the Jordan River, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice from heaven, you are my Son and the Beloved with whom I am well pleased. It is a revelation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that loudly proclaims the message and intent of the triune, the Trinity God. This intent is also great news indeed as it is a promise with great substance. It is a message of belonging, it is a portrayal of God's relationship towards Jesus. And different versions we read a little different ways, but um, as Jesus ascended from the water, the heavens rip open or are torn apart, and the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is said to come upon, so it sounds rather rather gent gentle. Jesus, to come upon Jesus or somebody else. But in this passage, the feeling is about a, a very per permanent presence, a, a constant companion that now is with, abides with Jesus as he goes forth. The point the gospel is making is that the promise of sonship and love made by God from heaven is given substance, it's, it's given teeth with the sending of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will be with Jesus during his ministry on earth. God does not leave the Son without hope or help. And like he never leaves us. And this is, this is very reassuring because just as God's words are reverberating in the heavens, Jesus is immediately then driven into the wilderness for 40 days. The, the desert or wilderness was always a sign of, of grave spiritual danger. Life could not flourish unless God started carving out a, a life-nourishing position of all his creatures. And throughout scripture, wilderness became shorthand for the devil's round, round for temptation, for threats to life, uh, and also threats to one's soul. So while Jesus is still dripping wet from his baptism, he's literally hurled into a far deeper wilderness experience where the wild animals prowled and howled. And up to this point in Mark's Gospel, Jesus hasn't uttered a word. He's not said one word in public before he's thrown into rock bottom. It's almost as though Jesus cannot credibly say or preach until he enters the worst into the worst evil on the planet. Before he can reliably declare that the kingdom of God is drawn near, maybe that is because the kingdom of God cannot draw near until the kingdom of darkness, the deep desert of, of evil and betrayal, is conquered. Thinking, thinking about that, and, and it may be a very trivial, trivial example, but years ago on the TV series MASH, the unit's priest, Dr. Mulcahy, or Father Mulcahy, tried to talk to a wounded soldier who had been severe, severely traumatized by what he witnessed on the front lines of the war. But when the soldier discovers that the good father had never been anywhere, close to where the fighting of the war was taking place, he concludes that they just don't have anything to talk about. The soldier had no interest in hearing the, the pious platitudes of one who had no idea what he was talking about. As the episode goes along, Father Mulcahy finds himself uh, forced uh, into a situation where there's enemy fire and he's forced to perform a an emergency medical procedure on a soldier, even as shells are exploding all around him. And the soldier welcomes the father after all. Now they have a common frame of reference. Now they can talk. 
And now, then, Father Mulcahy got it. Jesus could not sit, say the kingdom was near until he had been to the front lines, until he had engaged the evil of this world head on in the wilderness. Because then when he spoke words of hope and promise, everyone could know that he had spoken from reality and belief. He spoke the truth. This was someone who had occupied the jagged edges of the real life in a fallen world and had been so, and so emerged victorious. This is an early indication in the Gospels that where Jesus will go, Shalom will follow. Scott Jose shares this story. In Jesus' life, a funny thing happened again and again. When he touched the sick, they got well. When he touched the unclean, they got clean. Jesus reversed the conventional wisdom of, this, of his day that said it, is, said it is sickness that gets transferred from the sick to the healthy. Jesus went the other way, letting his health flow to those who were sick. Jesus reached out to the sick because he knew that the contagion of God's spirit which, with which he had been anointed was stronger than the contagion of sin. As it is with the wild animals, so with everyone else hereafter, where Jesus went, shalom followed. But people today have a hard time believing that. In the movie Pleasantville, we see a reversal of the Christian story. In the film, two teenagers from 1998 somehow got trapped inside a 1950s situation comedy show on TV. They suddenly find themselves in Pleasantville, USA, long about 1953. Like the old TV show itself, the entire town and all the people in it are in black and white. It is a typical caricature of 1950s button-down middle-class suburbia where mother wears a dress all the time, even when baking cookies. Dad goes off to some nondescript job every morning, returning home each evening around five with the characteristic, honey, I'm home. And in those pre-Elvis, pre-Beatles days, the teens of the town all were very and moral, according to the film, boring. So the kids from the future set about to inject some enlightenment into the town, and they do so through what else but sex. But no sooner do they start to spread the sexual revolution around town through seducing basketball players and providing homebound housewives with lessons on what sexuality is really all about, and suddenly the black and white town begins bursting into color. First it's just one red rose, but soon it's the entire persons, then enlightened, sexually active persons, of course, and finally, as the roaring 1990s get fully injected, into the stead 1950s, the entire town is in technicolor splendor. Get it? It is a reversal of the Garden of Eden story. Being moral is dull and, and lifeless and colorless. Eating the forbidden fruit is what gives life zing. The Garden of Eden bursts into color and full bloom after sin arrives, not before. The story of Jesus insist that we resist thinking this way. Because Jesus was the incarnation of Eden, regained. The world into which Jesus was born was black and white and lifeless. It's not anymore. But wherever Jesus went, whomever Jesus touched, suddenly new life and glorious color burst back onto the scene. Jesus came to restore Shalom to bring us back to God by bringing God down to us. We had gone astray. God sent his son to bring us back, to get us back on track. Jesus will touch the unclean, but not become unclean himself and leave cleanness in his way. He'll touch the dead and they'll come back to life. He'll speak to the blind and leave them seen, to the deaf and they will hear him leave. 
He'll enter circumstances of desolation and separation and leave behind him a wealth of hope and a sense of, of community. The wilderness, the worst place for life in a fallen, broken world. And Jesus begins there as a reminder to us that he is transforming this world by his very presence and, by, and transforming us as well. Jesus will leave even those places changed. As we advance forth in this new year and in time before long Lent and then Easter, we will walk with Jesus as he will pass through the hell of, of death and leave life in its wake. His tomb will be empty. Jesus has been to the front lines and back. And he still is and will be always with us in this new year and, and beyond. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> when Jesus comes to be baptized, number 100 in the red. something that I never really thought about being in a refugee camp you in school and this picture is of a kindergarten in a class in a refugee camp being a child in a refugee camp means facing lots of uncertainty at a very young age in addition to food and water being scarce education is generally not easily accessible some children were born in the camps while others fled with their families at a very young age. Either way, living in a refugee camp means children may not learn crucial cognitive and social skills. Since 1950, the Joint Christian, Christ, the Joint Christian Committee for Social Service has provided skills, training, and services to refugees living in a refugee camp in Lebanon. One of their incredible initiatives is a kindergarten program 
where children can engage in learning in a learning, happy, and secure place. Hundreds of children have graduated from the Joint Christian Committee for Social Services Kindergarten Program with the skills they need to thrive. After graduating, children continue in schools that welcome the basic knowledge and values they have learned. Your generosity through mission and service helps keep children learning all around the world. Thank you. And 2023 in the rear view. As we reflect on the past year and look forward to a new one, thank you for supporting mission and service. While we look forward to the new year and all the possibilities for joy and love that 2024 will bring, it's important to reflect on the growth we went through in 2023. Through the peace, pain, joys, and sorrows, it has been a true blessing to see God working through United Church people like you. Through earthquakes, conflict, economic decline, hunger, and other crises, United Church people are quick to ask, how can we help? Thank you for holding our neighbors in tender, warm care throughout a challenging year. You've helped put food on tables, rebuild communities after disaster, provide life-saving medication, educate children, and so much more. Your gifts continue to help partners as they respond to the immediate needs of people in Canada and around the world. Your gifts provide the light of hope and remove barriers to allow our partners to continue the important work they do. As we reflect on the past year and look forward to a new one, thank you for supporting mission and service. In the season of epiphany, God's gift to us in Christ is revealed to the world. Our gifts to God in Christ name reveal our commitment to love and mercy the forgiveness and hope we receive from god let us give with generous and hopeful hearts our offerings will now be received We thank you for the work of your church in all its expressions and for all that brings your love, healing, and justice into the world. We pray this morning for churches who are struggling financially or for churches enmeshed in conflict. We pray for those churches that are tired and in need of renewal, for congregations with a new sense of mission and purpose. We ask, Lord, to continue to guide them and give them and us all wisdom and strength as we seek your guidance and as we walk faithfully always in your way. We thank you for the healing we have known in our own lives, times that we have been forgiven, for relationships repaired and strengthened, for comfort in times of grief, for pain eased and recovery from illness. While COVID 
still haunts our communities. We pray for those struggling with its lingering effects or those with fresh infection. We pray for those in health care coping with challenges they have no easy solution, that have no easy solution. Give each one the hope and courage they need to face this new year. We pray for people around the world who must confront danger and conflict daily, for those working for justice in the face of oppression, and for all who know hunger and homelessness after drought and disaster. Give them hope and courage to face this new year. Lord, strengthen us to serve you not only with our words, but also with our actions. We include now the prayers on our prayer list and those that we name in our hearts. We pray for Robert and Tanya, for John, Luna, Louise, Norma, and many others whose faces and situations come to mind at this time. May the spirit of your presence, Lord, be felt in the hearts of these people and in the situations that they're dealing with. Help us to see others with your eyes and reach out with your compassion especially where differences divide. Teach us how to work together and show what it means to follow you in these changing times. Receive, Lord, these are prayers and receive us that all may be used in your ministry. In Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want to just share with you that uh, Tuesday evening, Robert and Tanya made it home. And I believe you celebrated Christmas Tuesday evening? Yes, yes. So they had Christmas on Tuesday when Robert and Tanya got home after two weeks in the hospital. And things are going well. So he was anxious, very anxious to get home. So was, he got his wish. So that's great. And Ralph, we thank you for playing for us today. Good to have you there. Our hymn to take us forth, and I believe there's some refreshments to follow over here for us all as well. We hope you will stay. 101, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise.
refreshments for us today. The season of Epiphany celebrates God's light breaking into the world. In Christ Jesus, and so, may the light of God lead you, the light of Christ embrace you, and the light of the Holy Spirit enliven you, so that you know both hope and peace this day and each coming day, always and forever. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 